praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be standing before uh, all of you one more time. I trust that God has been uh, keeping all of you safe uh, in his hands. Let us uh, turn to the book of Acts. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 27 today. I hope to kind of talk through the whole um, chapter. And as you know, this is the second to last uh, chapter in the book. And after a long, long uh, a period of study of the book of Acts, we're coming down to, uh, I believe, the second last message on it. And we'll have one more message uh, from the last chapter, and we'll wrap up the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 27. Uh, as we've kind of gone through this book, uh, God has really taught us, uh, when I say us, me, uh, myself and uh, Minu and Justin, many things from the book that we hadn't previously learned and understood. And I hope it was a blessing for all of you as well. Um, and, you, you know, you think you know or understand certain things, but God really reveals new uh, revelations and new thoughts uh, as we kind of... Uh, attempt to study his word, and I thank God for that. Uh, so the so book of Acts, chapter 27. So what is happening here, and uh, Justin, I uh, believe, ended uh, chapter 27 last, and Paul was before Festus and uh, King Agrippa, and I'm not going to go into that because I, I want to make sure I have enough time to cover the chapter 27, uh, but at the end of his uh, tr last trial before Festus and Agrippa, he appealed uh, to Caesar. And, and because he was a Roman citizen, uh, he had the right to appear before Caesar for his judgment. And um, I don't think, I don't know if they were being honest, but Agrippa said he would have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. Um, I'm not sure if he's being honest or not because they kept him for years in prison just to kind of, you know, uh, just for their own pleasure. So, but either way, so they decided to move forward and uh, they sent Paul with other prisoners. They were also headed to Rome and who knows what the other prisoners, uh, what all they were prisoners for. They could have been real, actual hardened criminals, uh, probably done, you know, serious crimes. Uh, but so Paul was sent along with those other prisoners, and he was committed to um, a centurion named Julius. So, so, this, so these prisoners were banded uh, together with, uh, with uh, the centurion and other soldiers, and they were put into a ship, and they were headed off to Italy. So now, just like... Uh, you know, if we want to, uh, you know, if you want to go to India, we don't, we don't get on a ship nowadays, right? We catch a plane. But sometimes uh, you, there's not a direct flight to India, right? So now Emirates flies through uh, Dal uh, Dallas, Dubai, and they can go to different places in India. So the same way, uh, it's a different mode of transportation, but it's kind of something like that what they had to do. They had to take two ships to get to their ultimate destination. But things did not go as planned as you are probably read Acts 27 before. Um, so what you'll see in this chapter is Paul has given unusual amounts of detail about the uh, sailing itself, right? So there's a lot of detail about how to, you know, run a ship, about, you know, anchors and uh, sails and rudders and all these things. And, um, and he was uh, using all of these terminology that some, some of them I had to look up, like what does this mean? But all of this unusual detail, and this whole chapter, it's a long chapter, is describing his journey from Caesarea all the way to ultimately Rome, but he, uh, it takes a long detour to get there, right? So, and they had to change two ships. So the way they would do it then is they went to a certain place, and then they found another ship, just like you change planes, right, in Dallas or Europe or Dubai or whatever, got on another ship, and they moved on into another ship when they got to a certain place. And if you can put up that map, the first slide. Um, and so, so my message is not really about his journey, but what we, uh, what we can learn from this whole account here, 
right? So one thing you see is, first thing is, you can see that Paul was brought into, it says that uh, tender, uh, I think the term was a tender friendship or with, with this Julius, okay? And he was very attached to Paul for whatever reason. He could have been attracted to him for his gentleness, for his demeanor, for, for his character. But either way, he did not treat Paul like the other prisoners. So he became close to him. He even allowed him to go and visit his friends because remember all these places they're traveling back through are uh, places that he had been before, right? He had set up churches, so he knew place, people at these places. So when the ship was, you know, it's not like the straight, it's not a Dallas, Dubai direct flight, right? They had to go through all these little cities uh, to get to their destination. So they'd be stopping at all these places, and Paul was allowed, and uh, when they reached Sidon, Paul was allowed to disembark and go and visit his friends and come back. And he, there's no other prisoner who was allowed that. Right, so it just shows Paul's uh, character and his gentleness and his meekness that allowed him to develop that relationship with his really his what prison guard, right? His the soldier was meant to be his oppressor. So many times, what we can learn from that is sometimes when we are in a situation we feel like we're you know unfair uh, because it was not fair for Paul to be counted as another prisoner. Right, but he was captured, and uh, in those moments, what will people see of us? What will our captors see of us, right? And so that fruit that people saw, uh, that he saw in him, uh, uh, got Paul a easy ride with them, right? But things were about to get rough. So anyway, so Paul, so you can see in this map, they started in Caesarea, they went up, so that little island on the right, on the right side, that one, I can probably read it, it says Cyprus, and they kind of went around it, and the re I'm saying a very short version, but if you read it, it gives you all these details. So they went up under Cyprus and over it, and they kind of sailed through these places called Pamphylia and, and Cilicia. Again, Paul was from Tarsus of Cilicia, so he was from all these places. So they sailed through between that island, kind of over, and came to this place called Myra. Right, so it's all going very well so far. It, they're headed to their destination, and, and you'll find out later there were 276 people on this, well, not on the ship, but in the second ship there'll be, there were 276 people, just to give you an idea that this was not this, you know, small little dingy, right? It's not this small little canoe or something like that. It was an actual big ship. And so, so anyway, so they were traveling. They reached this place called uh, Myra, and as, as they were leaving from there, oh, sorry, they, once they got to that place, they switched to another ship. This is what I said, they changed planes, right? They changed ships. And so they uh, boarded their connecting flight or connecting ship and got onto the second ship. And this second ship was carrying grain or wheat to all the way to Rome. So, so the prisoners and the centurion and the soldiers got off their ship and moved to this other ship, and it's not like they had a ticket in hand or something, right? They just asked around and, oh, you're going to Rome? Well, we'll just join you, right? So they just joined this other ship, and I believe it was God's plan on the second ship that they joined because you'll see later for the, uh, for the trouble they were about to get into, they needed the grain that was on that ship. So sometimes when we go through troubled times, uh, you should remember that God had already seen that ahead and he had prepared provisions for you even though you might have to go through trouble. It might seem like he abandoned us. He might question him and say, why did, he, why did he allow us to go through this difficulty? But God prepared a provision for Paul and the others because they went on this grain ship. Okay, so now... They went on, uh, so they left, so they on this thing, and they left this place, and the things started to get a little rocky, okay? So there was a, uh, there was a, li there was a um, little bit of wind, and they, it was very difficult. They came through uh, that place called Snyder's. You'll see, see that at top, where the top of the triangle, right? The ship was going up, 
They came to that place, it's called Snyder's, and it was really hard. The wind was picking up. If you all ever been on a boat when it's been really windy, right? It's just hard if it's just a sailboat, right? And people are probably kind of direct the sails to make, you know, make it go ahead. And so then somehow they go to this other island on the left side called Crete. And these are real places here that exist now. So one thing you see is all the detail and the places, they still exist today. Um, and they might be called by something else, other name uh, in modern times, but Crete is a place today you can go visit. So anyway, so, so they came to Crete and this, with very much difficulty, they came around the island and they play, uh, stopped in a place called the Fair Havens. You can see the bottom, the very left of that island. Okay, so they came to this place called Fair Havens and they just stopped there and they they didn't like that place. They thought, okay, we'd spend the winter here. Now, this is not like going to India on Emirates because, you know, you can spend one day and you can get there, right? This is sometimes weeks and months to get to your destination. So they were going to spend winter there uh, because it may have been difficult to travel during that time. So anyway, so, and I don't know if it's three months of winter or just a few weeks or whatever, but it doesn't matter. So they were going to, but then, uh, then they decided they want to go to a, a better place to spend winter, and and they they were going to move forward. And then Paul suddenly said, "Listen, sirs, hold up right there. I think if you try to go ahead now, you're going to have a lot of trouble. You're going to uh, you might not lose your life, but I think the ship." and the cargo will be completely destroyed. I believe God used Paul to warn those people, okay? And the centurion who was now close to Paul did not believe him, right? He, he decided to believe the ship master and the people who are experienced in driving a ship. And we sometimes have that experience in our own lives, right? We say the right thing, and people don't believe us. People are like, you, you crazy. Have you had that experience? They're like, all this science and, ex, you know, all this wealth of knowledge and experts are saying, this is what we should do. And you're saying, no, God is saying, don't go that way. It's dangerous. And a gentle warning, right? Yes? You all with me with, so far? Okay. So, so they decided to ignore Paul and move forward. This is where, when things started getting even harder, right? So as they went past Crete, the wind started picking up. It got really hard. Now imagine, okay, I don't know how many people are here today. Uh, maybe, what, 100, 50, 100? Either way. So imagine this whole building is the ship, okay? Just imagine for a second. And you're in this kind of place, and you're on the ship, and you're now moving ahead in the midst of the storm, this wind that is picking up. It's rocking this whole building, right, like the ship. And you, you don't know what's going to happen, and they're just trying to get to this next island. And Paul had just said, stop, don't go forward. And, and he, they decided to go anyway because what happened was, for a second, for a moment, there was this slight favor. The wind stopped for a second. And it looked like uh, things are going to be okay. They thought, okay, you know what? See, I told you, it's going to be okay. So sometimes we also handle things this way. Sometimes we know what God has told us, has warned us, but things start looking a little bit favorable and maybe like, you know what? I was right all along. I'm just going to do what I want. And, but God is not wrong. The, if God has put his spirit in you and given you, you know, uh, an unction or a, a direction in a certain way, where it is more advantageous to us to listen to him. Sometimes we try to seek our own way and then we just make things difficult on us more than it should have been. Right? But even in those moments, remember, as it says, even though righteous man falls or stumbles, 
right? He will never fall. God is still with us even in our moments where we ignore his warnings, his word, and we move forward. He's still with us. But the journey might be really difficult after that point because we chose to ignore his warning, right? So anyway, so the ship just went forward. As soon as they did that, this whole favorable conditions now suddenly became really unfavorable really quick. Like it says, things got bad real fast. So, and this wind, it's interesting that they named this wind. I mean, verse 14, if you're following along, Acts chapter 27. So imagine you're in the ship, right, in this building. So you're in this uh, journey along with Paul, and the ship stopped rocking for a few moments. You decided to go forward, and now this wind called Euryclidon, I think it's like the nor'easter, right? It's interesting that they had names for the wind at that time. Like we have, you know, Hurricane Ida, Hurricane Katrina, all these named storms, right? So same way. So this Euryclidon, bang, showed up and took the control of the ship. So sometimes we're in the middle of problems and we just, you know, we try to fight it. We try to do our own way. And then things are, become so overwhelming that we just lose control, right? We don't even know what's happening. And things are going so bad, and we can't see ahead of us. That's exactly what happened. They were trying to go to this other island. They thought it would be a better place to winter in. And, and, and something seemingly worse happened, and the wind took control of their ship, and they just got put out into open sea. Okay, now if you imagine, I don't know, maybe you've been in a cruise or, you know, in a ship journey. I haven't. Uh, frankly, it's... Uh, very terrifying to think of to just be in the open water. Um, uh, so anyway, so if you go to the next slide, you can see. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, they'll get there. Um, so if you see the next slide, you'll see there it is. So so where we were is on the right side that where it says Crete. If you can't see it, so they got pushed out from there. And now this wind, they were driving the ship until that point, like this building. They were driving it. They thought they had control. Now the wind took over, and they got pushed out into open sea. I know it looks nice and blue here, but if you're in the middle of that, you'll realize you can't see any land, and it's all dark, and, and not only that, the wind is now rocking the boat, and it could have been raining, and they don't have any control over what ha what's happening. And they're in the middle of the storm that they thought they were going to lose their life. And they were so scared that they did not eat. And it says it had been 14 days. They were in the middle of this open water, just tossed to and fro for 14 days. So imagine if you're, I mean, I know we don't like to be stuck in here for three hours, right? We like to get out of here and, and it's, the building's not even moving, right? Okay, all right. Maybe I'm not the only one. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, so imagine being stuck in a place like this for 14 days, and it's all shaking and maybe feel like, it, feel like it'll topple over, and it's dark. You can't see anything. That's what it says. They, they couldn't see anything because it was so stor it was such stormy weather. They didn't know what was going to happen. And in the middle of this storm, at the end of this, towards the end of this, you can imagine, and it says, um, verse 21. I, I mean, let's just read, actually. Um, uh, I just want to read this, verse uh, 17 through uh, 21. Which, when they had taken up, they used helps, uh, undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strike sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But... After a long abstinence, I mean, wow, that is a long abstinence. Almost like one of the fruit of the Spirit called what? 
self-control. 14 days. Paul did not rake them over the coals and say, I told you, I told you you should have stayed. I told you that this was going to be a problem. But he kept silent. Now this is nothing but the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. Can you imagine? But when he spoke and he said, he did say, you should have, you should have listened to me, sirs, and not have left Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. He, didn't, he did point that out, right? But his intention was not of condemnation because he said, verse 22, now I exhort you to be of good cheer and there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. But there, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. How be it, we must cast upon a certain island. Okay, so, so now you can see another fruit of the Spirit that Paul is displaying, right? Which is self-control, right? You all remember your fruit of the Spirit? Yes? So, and then he's showing what? Peace and joy and love towards his... He didn't say, okay, you all save yourself, you didn't listen to me. But no, he's showing the love that he had for the people that were with him, right? Again, more fruit of the Spirit. Why am I saying all of this? The point is that I know through, as we walk through the book of Acts, we spoke many times about the works of the Spirit and all the gifts of the Spirit and all the mighty miracles and all the things that God had done through the apostles. But this chapter shows to me how we must have the fruit of the Spirit in us to shed the light of God amongst other people. What Paul displayed there is not the mighty miracles to stop the wind and the sea. Could he have done that? Yes, he could have done that. But he showed the fruit of the Spirit in the midst of that great difficulty. And that's what God wants us to do. As Just like when Paul, uh, Jesus was walking with his disciples and he saw a fig tree and he reached for a fruit and he didn't find the fruit and he cursed it and when they came back, the the tree was completely withered and his disciples were like, but, uh, but it's not the season for fruit. Why are you blaming the tree? It's not the season to produce figs. It's not the tree's fault. So Jesus is going to look for that fruit when it is not the season. Meaning when you are in the most difficult time, when it's the worst time to show love and self-control and joy and peace, that's when God wants, he's going to reach in and want to grab a fruit from you. You all with me? Are you able to say amen to that? When somebody insults you to your face, are you able to be quiet? When somebody takes something from you that will belong to you, are you willing to show love and joy and peace? And this is what Paul was doing. Imagine we're in the ship together and one, so one person stands up and says, you know, God showed me, uh, you, you know, that, that we're all going to be safe. How are we going to treat them? Right? He didn't have fear. He didn't have fear to stand up and show, uh, tell them the truth. Right? But God wants the fruit from us when we least think is the right situation to do so. Right? That's when our fruit should be showing. You all with me? And you can see, I can, you can look through all of the diff, uh, nine fruit of the Spirit. And you can see all of that displayed through Paul here in this awesome chapter. You just take the time to study it. You can see all of them. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. All of them. But this is an example of how the fruit of the Spirit should work through us in our lives to other people. Okay? So, okay, so now to finish the story, I'm going to, my time's running out. So, um, and as they were towards the end of this journey, um, 
you know, what happened was they sounded what sounds like a sonar, right? Like the waves, they send out sound waves and they understood that there was an island like uh, about 200 feet away. And they went closer and they sounded another island. And, and so what their ship's captain was going to, uh, basically there were some lifeboats, seems like, uh, if you, uh, um, so, and, and they were going to get, escape from the uh, lifeboat and run to that island. And Paul was like, no, unless everybody stays on this boat, uh, none of us will be saved. So how, how many of us you know, have that conviction that everybody that is in our lives, we want all of us to be saved. We want all of us to be in the kingdom of God. All of us, are, and we don't want anybody to be lost. So he's saying, don't be selfish, don't leave. But God's word is, if all of us remain in this ship, and sometimes when we are in the middle of this trouble, we want to just somehow escape. We want to just get out, and it's just like uh, Abraham with uh, Ishmael, right, or Hagar. He's like, oh, God, I'm tired of waiting for your promise. I just want to have my son. Maybe God meant this. And then he had Ishmael. But God is saying, no, wait for his promise. Don't seek your own way. But if you wait in this ship, the, you might lose the ship. You might lose the you know, worldly things, whether it's your job or your wealth or whatever, health. But if you stay in the ark, just like Noah, you can escape judgment. If you stay on the boat, if you're with Christ, you might lose everything in this world, but you will be fine. Amen? And that's what Paul is saying. Stay on the ship. So anyway, so then they drove uh, to this island and then uh, to fast forward, uh, the ship hit some rocks and the front part of the ship got stuck and then the waves came and destroyed the back half. And again, the soldiers want to kill all the prisoners because they don't want to be blamed. And imagine, after all, the, after all these days, they were going to kill them. But the centurion who remembered Paul protected him and said, no, no, no. We need everybody alive. So then everybody swam to shore, you know, on broken pieces of the wood and all of that. And all, every single person, 276 people, after these weeks of being in the middle of nowhere, were saved, safe and sound. He said, not one hair of your head will be lost. That's what Paul said. And that's exactly what happened. With no harm. Everybody was saved, safe and sound, 276 people, and that should not have happened, right? What we can see is the power of God's hand if you remain in his plan, okay? He is able to bring us to the destination. He, he is able to, what does Jeremiah 29 says? Well, I plan, the, for I know the plans I have for you, and worship team, you can come up. Uh, can you put up that second map one more time? Um, I know the plan that I have for you, plans of peace, and to bring you to an expected end. Yeah. Amen. So if you think about it, look, look at this. You can't even see the island they came to. It's called Malta or Melita. And this little island, you can't see it. But God knew where exactly to take them. So the, where we're going, the answer to our prayer is not visible to us. You know, it looks like, oh, I don't know how we're going to get there. I mean, it's all stormy. Things look like I'm going to lose everything in this world. It looks horrible. But God knows how to bring you to that little island. Amen. Amen. The question is, are we willing to trust in him, in the voice of his spirit that is speaking to our heart, to obey his voice and to stay the course? Are we willing to do that? And God will bring us to that destination. Maybe the, oh, they went through all of this, and we'll see in chapter 28, to bring the gospel to that little island, there were barbarians, but God wanted to bring the gospel to that island. God allowed them to go through all of this so that that can happen. It could be. But either way, he knows the plans that he has for each one of us. Are we willing to stay the course and trust in his voice and in his plans? May his name be glorified.